Sweden, respectively, allowing Soviet engineers to fashion quiet seven-bladed propellers. The larger killer, which displaced nearly 13,000 tons submerged, featured a steel double hull typical to Soviet submarines, allowing the vessel to take on more ballast water and survive more damage. The attack submarine's propulsion plant was rafted to dampen sound, and anechoic tiles coated its outer and inner surface. Even the limber holes which allowed water to pass inside the Achilles outer hull had retractable covers to minimize acoustic returns. The 111-meter-long vessel was distinguished by its elegant, aqua-dynamic conning tower and the teardrop-shaped pod atop the tail fin which could deploy a towed passive sonar array. A crew of around 70 could operate the ship for 100 days at sea. Powered by a single 190 megawatt pressurized water nuclear reactor with a high density core, the Aquila could swim a fast 33 knots, 38 miles per hour, and operate 480 meters deep, 200 meters deeper than the contemporary Los Angeles class submarine. More troubling for the US Navy, though. The Aquila was nearly as stealthy as the Los Angeles class. American submariners could no longer take their acoustic superiority for granted. On the other hand, the Aquila's own sensors were believed to be inferior. The Aquila I submarines, designated Shchuka, Pike, in Russian service, were foremost intended to hunt U.S. Navy submarines, particularly ballistic missile submarines. Four 533 mm torpedo tubes and four large 650 mm tubes could deploy up to 40 wire guided torpedoes, mines, or long range SSN 15 Starfish and SSN 16 Stallion anti ship missiles. The Aquila could also carry up to 12 Granat cruise missiles capable of hitting targets on land up to 3,000 km away. Soviet shipyards pumped out seven Aquila is while the U.S. Navy pressed ahead to build the even stealthier Sea Wolf class submarine to compete. However, even as the Soviet Union collapsed, it launched the first of five Project 971 U improved Aquila I boats. This was followed by the heavier and slightly longer 971 A Aquila II class in the form of the Veprin 1995 which featured a double-layer silencing system for the powertrain, dampened propulsion systems and a new sonar. Both variants had six additional external tubes that could launch missiles or decoy torpedoes, and a new Striller 3 surface-to-air missile system. However, the most important improvement was to stealth. The new Achilles were now significantly quieter than even the improved Los Angeles-class submarines, although some analysts argue that the latter remain stealthier at higher speeds. You can check out an Office of Naval Intelligence comparison chart of submarine acoustic stealth here. The U.S. Navy still operates 43 Los Angeles-class boats, though 40 newer Sea Wolf and Virginia-class submarines still beat out the Aquila in discretion. However, Russian shipyards have struggled to complete new Aquilas, which are not cheap. One figure claims a cost of $1.55 billion each in 1996, or $2.4 billion in today's dollars. The struggling Russian economy can barely afford to keep the already completed vessels operational. Two Achilles were scrapped before finishing construction and three were converted into Bora-class ballistic missile submarines. As for the Aquila II Vepra, it was beset by tragedy in 1998 when a mentally unstable teenage seaman killed eight fellow crew members while at dock, and threatened to blow up the torpedo room in a standoff before committing suicide. After lingering a decade in construction, the G-Pod, the only completed Aquila III boat, was deployed in 2001, reportedly boasting what was then the pinnacle of Russian stealth technology. Seven years later, Moscow finally pushed through funding to complete the Aquila II Nerpa after 15 years of bungled construction. However, during sea trials in November 2008, a fire alarm was triggered inadvertently, flooding the sub with Freon firefighting gas that suffocated 20 on board, mostly civilians. The most serious recent incident in a long and eventful history of submarine disasters. After an expensive round of repairs, 
the NERPA was ready to go, and promptly transferred on a 10-year lease to India for $950 million. Redubbed the INS Chakra, it served as India's only nuclear-powered submarine for years. Armed with the shorter construction, the Pentagon added a special 100-foot-long, 2,500-ton module called the Multi-Mission Platform. By the sailing branch's own admission, this space can accommodate undersea drones, seals and much more. More importantly, the hourglass-shaped section might allow specially trained teams to find and tap undersea communications lines and plant listening devices on the ocean floor. It's more than likely that the submarine is one of the Pentagon's most stealthy spies. Another clue is the Presidential Unit Citation for Mission 7. For the sailing branch, this is akin to giving the boat itself an AV Cross, the service's second highest award. The criteria makes it clear that the mission must have been extremely difficult and hazardous. But the Secretary of the Navy's citation for the sub's 2013 performance is equally obtuse. Along with sailors from the even more obscure detachment undersea research and development, Jimmy Carter successfully completed extremely demanding and arduous independent submarine operations of vital importance to the national security of the United States, is how the memo described the operation. Both units overcame numerous obstacles to safely execute these demanding and complex tasks without incident. Two pictures attached to the report show the ship's captain, Commander Brian L. Kowitz, and other officers holding the frame citation and associated pennant. In both cases, Navy sensors blacked out one individual's face, ostensibly for privacy reasons. Wars Barring obtained these documents through the Freedom of Information Act. Every year, all ships, subs, squadrons of aircraft and commands on land are required to turn a historical report over to the Naval History and Heritage Command in Washington, D.C., but there's no requirement that the narrative go into any great or specific detail. And Jimmy Carter's history is more a record of the secrecy surrounding the ships than her actual activities. While already guarded about submarines in general, the Navy is especially tight-lipped about the Sea Wolf-class boats. Originally intended to be the most advanced undersea attackers, Washington slashed the program after the Cold War and the threat of equally high-tech Soviet submarines appeared to evaporate. Instead of a planned fleet of nearly 30 ships, the Pentagon bought just three for more than $3 billion each. At more than 350 feet long and with a submerged displacement of more than 9,100 tons, the Sea Wolf class is the most expensive attack submarine ever built and the second most expensive undersea vessel of any type. The sailing branch eventually grouped together the USS Sea Wolf, Connecticut and Jimmy Carter as the Corps of Submarine Development Squadron 5. The unit's Spartan website states it is responsible for testing new undersea listening gear and remote-controlled submersibles, either tethered to a larger sub or able to operate on their own. The group is also in charge developing new tactics for fighting in the Arctic, a region where submarines can easily hide from their opponents. Despite their current mission, each ship still has eight torpedo tubes, which can also fire Harpoon anti-ship and Tomahawk cruise missiles. The unit makes no mention of intelligence gathering. But while the name implies a solely experimental function, the sailing branch routinely uses these types of monikers for special or elite groups. The near-legendary terrorist hunting SEAL Team 6 is officially called the Naval Special Warfare Development Group. The service describes the spy ships it runs together with the U.S. Air Force as missile range instrumentation ships. The squadron responsible for flying around the president and his staff is now simply called Marine Helicopter Squadron 1, but still uses the acronym HMX-1, a nod to its experimental or Defend your homeland against a large-scale nuclear attack then the next best option is to threaten adversaries with devastating retaliation if they launch one. In other words, you have to convince the enemy that attacking America would be suicidal. The strategy is called deterrence. And it is the main reason why no foreign nation has seriously threatened the US with nuclear aggression since the Navy built out its undersea missile force. When the goal is deterring aggression, the key metric of success isn't how many weapons a country possesses. It's how many weapons survive a surprise attack, because those are the weapons the enemy has to worry about.
possessing a secure retaliatory force is the sine qua non of effective deterrence. So deploying hundreds of D-5 missiles on submarines that stay submerged and undetectable for months at a time is just about the most potent deterrent imaginable. The US actually maintains a triad of nuclear systems, D-5S on submarines, land-based ballistic missiles, and long-range bombers, so enemies can harbor no illusions about their ability to disarm America in a surprise attack. But countries like Russia know precisely where US land-based missile silos and bomber bases are located, so they could hypothetically be targeted in a crisis. The submarines can't be. Once they are on station under the Atlantic or Pacific Oceans, they are essentially impossible to find, and thus highly survivable. That's why the Pentagon plans to deploy over two-thirds of the warheads in the US strategic arsenal on submarines in the years ahead. A single Ohio-class ballistic missile submarine has two dozen missile tubes, and each of the D-5S in those tubes carries at least several nuclear warheads that can be directed at separate targets. The missiles can carry up to 14 warheads, although the max per missile today is probably 8 due to arms control limitations. Each warhead has a yield of 100 or 475 kilotons, and can hit within 300 feet of intended targets. At those yields, 5 to 25 times the explosive power of the weapon that leveled Hiroshima in 1945, the warheads carried by a D-5 can destroy pretty much anything, including a hardened command bunker. So even an erratic foreign leader like Kim Jong-un would have to think long and hard before attacking the US chances are, such leaders would not survive the first wave of US retaliation, which would arrive from Navy submarines less than 30 minutes after the attack was detected. The Navy has begun developing a next-generation submarine designated to the Columbia class that will be even harder to track than the 14 Ohio class boats comprising the current undersea deterrent. The first such vessel will commence construction at the Electric Boat Unit of General Dynamics in 2021, with delivery planned for 2027, about the time that Cold War ballistic missile subs begin retiring. But the Navy hasn't developed a successor to the D-5, because it isn't clear something better is needed. What the Navy is doing instead is extending the life of the D-5 design from 25 years to 50 by modernizing everything from the guidance system to the re-entry vehicle hosting the warheads. The program commenced in 2002 and the first two life extended missile were loaded onto a sub in February. So when the first Columbia class sub goes to sea at the end of the next decade, it will be carrying D-5 missiles, as will the next generation of British ballistic.
one vehicle to get it in the water, as quickly as possible, he said. The objective is to get the first phase one prototype wet in 19. So get it in the water, as quickly as possible, get it into the hands of our sailors, enable them to use it and get those lessons learned and that feedback, and that will feed our future LDU UV acquisition program. In fact, it will feed our family of UUV programs. The Phase 1 Snakehead will focus on intelligence and preparation of the environment and intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance mission sets, and Phase 2 would seek to add extended ranges to both missions. The eventual program of Record Snakehead Increment 1 would include additional payloads, potentially including electronic warfare, mine warfare, mine countermeasures, anti-submarine warfare and anti-surface warfare, according to a UUV systems vision chart included in Burkhoff's presentation. The Navy last year decided to use the Naval Undersea Warfare Center Newport as the government lead systems integrator for the snakehead effort to save time. Industry is engaged in the program and working on the power system, sensors and other aspects, but the Navy itself will design and integrate the vehicle that will end up in the water, Burkhoff explained. Additionally, the project timeline will be boosted through its selection by Navy leadership as one of three rapid acquisition projects to test out new authorities, in LDUUV's case, the authorities in the Maritime Accelerated Capabilities Office. Burkhoff explained that Snakehead will still have to reach traditional acquisition milestones, but the Navy will be waiving some of the traditional program of record requirements, with leadership approval, and we have a direct line to senior service leadership to help remove any roadblocks that pop up. At the same time, Burkhoff told, the Office of Naval Research will continue with its innovative naval prototype efforts. The first two vehicles will go to the Unmanned Systems Program Office, Burkhoff said, one of which is an empty hull that will be put on display and the other which will go to a squadron out of Keyport to learn operational lessons that will feed the Snakehead program. With its two remaining vehicles, they will continue research and development efforts on specifically software and autonomy and all that. Ibius Transport Dock and will be formally commissioned into service later this year, earning the prefix United States Ship or USS. I am amazed with the shipbuilders here at Ink Halls, Captain J.R. Hill, Portland's prospective commanding officer, said. There are thousands of them who have been working to build this ship and put it into service and they've really done a great job. I'm very impressed with the team in Gauls has put together as well as the 370 crew members present today who are ecstatic about taking control of this ship. We look forward to what she can do in the future. The shipyard workers, who have often spent their lives building these massive vessels, were pleased at having completed the delivery of another ship. Today is a great day for this collective industry and customer team, Carrie Wilkinson, in Gaul's Vice President for Program Management, said. For many of the shipbuilders, supervisor of shipbuilding representatives and members of the Navy Program Office, this is the 11th ship they have built and delivered together. Their personal commitment to excellence has become the hallmark of the LPD program, and we are positioned to continue that tradition on future ships. With Portland formally delivered to the U.S. Navy, he can focus on completing Fort Lauderdale, LPD-28, which is the 12th San Antonio-class ship being built for the service. Meanwhile, the Navy will soon award the shipyard, located in Pascagoula, Mississippi, a contract to build LDP-29. He has already been awarded an advanced procurement contract in June to start work on the long lead items for that next vessel. The U.S. Navy had originally planned to buy 12 San Antonio-class ships here. During low-rate initial production, Northrop Grumman will make three Tridents a year. Eventually, the Navy will have 68 of the drones, a lucrative production cycle that analysts said will help Northrop Grumman keep its production line up and running. Total program costs for Triton were estimated at $16.8 billion as of December 2016, according to a Defense Department report released in July. Triton, together with the P-8 Poseidon jet, is intended to replace the propeller-driven P-3C Orion, 
which has patrolled the sea for the Navy since the early 1960s, and the EP-3E Ares II aircraft. The drone will assume the intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance duties, while the P-8 Poseidon will focus on anti-submarine warfare. In a statement, the Navy said Trident will be able to keep constant watch over the ocean surface and augment the P-8's ability to detect surface ships and submarines. An upgraded version of the drone with enhanced intelligence capabilities will be available by 2020. It's a 24-hour unblinking eye in the sky, said Doug Schaffer, Vice President and Program Manager for Triton at Northrop. Triton is part of Northrop's Global Hawk family and looks like a model that has been used by the U.S. Air Force in Libya, Afghanistan, and Iraq. But there are a few key differences. Triton has been optimized for the inclement weather it could face while soaring above the oceans, with lightning protection strips on the nose and elsewhere on the aircraft, heater blankets on the edges of the wings and icing systems on the engine inlet. This drone will also be able to perform a so-called dip maneuver, a Navy request that when that you are going to die, and the key to success is telling yourself, you can do it. That's what Barker, who runs a popular blog by the same name as the book, is saying. He writes that, after 9-11, the military needed more SEALs, but for obvious reasons, didn't want to lower their standards. Ultimately, they developed a mental toughness program in which Bud, S, basic underwater demolition, SEAL training, candidates learn to develop essential skills, including positive self-talk. In fact, Barker writes, when the Navy started teaching candidates to use positive self-talk, in conjunction with the other skills, but, S passing rates improved almost 10%. The History Channel documentary The Brain, you can watch a clip here, explores how positive self-talk can help, but, S candidates chances of success. According to the documentary, the average person says between 300 and 1000 words to themselves every single minute. If these words are positive instead of negative, they help override the fear signal coming from a part of the brain called the amygdala. The amygdala kicks into gear during threatening situations like pool comp, the underwater exercise described above. Barker gives examples of negative self-talk, I'm just not cut out for this or I've never been any good at these things, and of positive self-talk, I just need to keep working at it or I just need better tips on form. If the second set of thoughts becomes your default, Barker says, you're more likely to succeed at whatever you're trying to accomplish. Note that you're not telling yourself, everything